for this opportunity. I am really honored to be invited by you and to be able to speak to all the worthy participants. And thank you to all of them for making the time to attend this session. Um, I will quickly run through a few things in my mind. I will explain them as quickly as I can, maybe in the next 15 minutes, and then I think we can move on to the question and answer sessions. And I would like to warn all of you that since I'm still advising the ministry, so don't ask questions which are too difficult to answer. Okay, so I will start with the concept of debt sustainability. I will not get into its technical definition. I will refer to its practical definition, which is followed around the world and is actually championed by the likes of IMF. So the pragmatic definition is that there are one or two key ratios. And in order to be considered sustainable, those ratios should either already be within reasonable limits or the country should be able to bring them down to those reasonable levels and then sustain them. And the country should not be required to make extremely large uh, fiscal adjustments in order to achieve that. So the fiscal adjustments that are needed should be politically feasible and realistic. So that's a practical definition. And those two key ratios are debt to GDP and gross financing needs to GDP. And I would like to, and, and I would like to tell you three or four key variables or drivers of debt sustainability. So if those variables are not moving in the right direction, then the country, any country, is at risk of uh, uh, making its debt unsustainable over the medium to long run. So those three or four drivers are the real GDP growth rate, the rate at which your economy is growing in real terms, your real cost of borrowing, your real exchange rate, and your primary balance. So any country needs to have the right mix of these three or four variables in order to keep its debt sustainable. Preferably the cost of borrowing should be lower than the rate of GDP growth. The, current, the country should not experience large real depreciations uh, in its currency. And the primary balance, if the debt levels are already high, then the country should be able to run primary surpluses for a few years at the least until the debt ratios fall back to acceptable levels. Now, I would like to tell you a little bit about the debt sustainability analysis that IMF runs for Pakistan almost every year. So they ran their recent analysis back in February 22. It's published as part of their report. So you can see the details in that report, but I will give you the crux of their findings. They look at the baseline levels of both the key variables that I just mentioned, and then also stress test these variables under five different stress scenarios in which they apply a shock to the GDP growth, to the primary balance, to the exchange rate, and to the interest rate. And then there is a combined shock scenario. So they see how these two key ratios are moving. And their benchmarks are 70% debt to GDP ratio for developing countries. And the GFN to the gross financing need to GDP ratio should be 
no more than 15% for any financial year. And the debt to GDP, the stock of debt to GDP should not be more than 70%. That's a rule of thumb. If it is more than that, then of course, the country requires more detailed scrutiny. And then there are four or five debt vulnerability indicators also. They also see what is happening to those indicators. They are mainly related to the external loans of the country. Its cost of borrowing in the international markets, the size of its external debt, and you know, stuff like that. Mainly related to external debt. And there is one variable which pertains to the mix of short-term and long-term debt in the overall debt profile. So if the short-term debt is declining and the proportion of long-term debt is increasing, that is a good sign and vice versa. So IMF has concluded that although Pakistan's debt to GDP ratio is above the limit or the ceiling of 70%, but with some fiscal adjustment, uh, and, and consistency in policies, Pakistan can bring its debt to GDP ratio down to around 70% within a few years. So despite raising a lot of, a number of red flags, the IMF concludes that the debt is sustainable, but the government needs to follow strict fiscal discipline. Now, I would like to tell you a little bit about the debt profile. I'm sure most of you probably already know about it, but just a quick uh, review. Uh, the total size of government's debt at the end of the last financial year or at the beginning of the current financial year was around 40 trillion, almost two thirds of this amount was domestic debt and one third was external debt. And due to the large fiscal deficit and the substantial currency depreciation that we have experienced during the current year, we think that the total debt will cross 44 trillion by the end of this month, which would be the end of the financial year as well. So we're looking at more than 44 trillion of, of the worth of the government debt. As to the cost of borrowing, uh, it has been ranging between four to 5% of GDP, but due to the recent increase in interest rates, uh, we are expecting that the next year's borrowing cost would be probably a little above 5% of GDP. I think you must have seen the estimates of the Ministry of Finance, which are already published in the, in the budget documents. So more than 5% of GDP is very high by international standards, considering that the rule of thumb uh, uh, that is followed globally to, to evaluate a country's fiscal discipline is that the budget deficit should not exceed 3% of GDP in any financial year. This is the rule that European Union follows and most other countries follow. Pakistan also has a Fiscal Responsibility and Debt Limitation Act, which says that uh, the government will not run a budget deficit of more than 3%, 3.5% in some bad years, but 3% in general during any financial year. So we are in a situation where only the interest expense is exceeding 5% of GDP. And our debt levels are already quite high. So all the indicators are pointing towards stricter fiscal discipline. And that's exactly what the IMF is also recommending. And, 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 and the direction now is that Pakistan should do its best to run primary surpluses over the next few years to slow down the growth in its debt. 
and at the same time try and hopefully grow its GDP at a faster rate. And the combination of these factors will uh, uh, bring the debt to GDP ratio downwards. But there is one indicator and it also relates to the cost of borrowing, uh, which probably the IMF's debt sustainability analysis does not take as seriously as it probably should. And that is the interest expense to revenue ratio. Since our borrowing costs are quite high because of high domestic inflation, our domestic borrowing costs typically average around 10%. And in bad years, when, when short-term rates are high, our average domestic borrowing costs are even higher. So, and since most of our, of our debt is domestic, our overall uh, uh, borrowing costs have increased significantly. And if you uh, analyze these costs as, as a percentage of the total revenue of the federal government, you will see that interest expenses already ranging around 80% or more of the total revenues of the federal government. So this is a, a scale indicator and and which which emphasizes the need to uh, bring the debt level and and also to bring down the borrowing costs going forward if you look at the sources of buildup of debt in recent years you will find if you look at the last 12 or 13 years maybe since 2008 you will find that almost 25% of the additional debt that has been additional debt is attributable to primary deficits and the remaining 70 to 75% is attributable to interest expenses and currency deval. So the numbers clearly show that uh, Pakistan is kind of stuck in a, in a mini debt trap in which it's high interest costs and it's uh, currency D well are, are uh, leading to uh, an even greater increase in the debt levels with every passing year. And some drastic measures are needed to slow down this process and, and hopefully reverse it. Now, finally, coming to the challenges that the government faces, uh, of course, the major challenge is that of fiscal discipline. The government needs to, as I said, re, uh, run primary surpluses for a few years at the least. And if you look at the IMF's projections, uh, you will see that they are actually projecting primary surpluses for the next few years. So considering that our borrowing costs are quite high and our debt levels are quite high, running primary surpluses is becoming like an absolute necessity for us. So that's a major challenge. And another reason why it is a big challenge, which is difficult to overcome, is that generally the governments as well as the general public perceive that there is a trade-off between fiscal discipline and economic growth. Uh, and in countries like ours, the general public as well as the, the, the governments are, are typically obsessed with higher economic growth rates and they, they, are, they are averse to following any policies that might slow down the growth rate. So this perception that there is a negative trade-off between fiscal discipline and economic growth is not helping us. 
And if you analyze these two more carefully, you will see that this trade-off is probably only valid in the short run. Yes, if you go for higher taxation and, and, and stricter expenditure management, your economic growth will probably slow down a little bit in the short run. But if you analyze the trends over the medium to long run of other countries as well, you will find that over the medium to long term, these two factors actually reinforce each other. They go together. So if you follow fiscal discipline for a few years, eventually your economic growth also comes back up and you can have a faster and more sustainable growth for a much longer period of time. So as a country, we need to come out of this. Uh, uh, this we need to, to deal with this perception. That's, that's my opinion. And now finally, the challenge pertaining to debt strategy and debt management. Uh, during my recent experience with the federal government, I found that there are four or five key measures that can be used to evaluate how effective a country's debt management strategy is. Uh, but one thing should be kept in mind, if the debt levels are already very high and the fiscal deficits are high, it's very difficult to, uh, uh, it is very difficult for any debt management strategy to deliver the desired results because the environment can become so challenging and difficult that uh, balancing uh, all the debt related targets becomes very difficult. So these four or four, four or five measures include the maturity profile of debt. As Saad told you, until a few years, which was not a good thing in the time of crises, uh, a large amount of short term debt can be very problematic and it can become difficult for the government to go out in the market and raise huge amounts of money after short time periods. So average time to maturity is an important uh, measure and typically an overall average maturity of five years or above is considered decent. Uh, Pakistan, I think is close to that. Uh, our external debt is quite long-term. I think the average maturity of the external is around seven years. That of domestic is a little less than four. And the average would be somewhere around five, maybe a little less. The next would be the average cost of borrowing, uh, which of course should be as low as possible. And then, there is the percentage of fixed rate debt and the percentage of external debt uh, within the total debt portfolio. So the, the idea is that the country should have more fixed rate debt so that its interest costs are more predictable uh, and should have a low proportion of external debt so that it is less vulnerable to uh, external account crises. And another important measure is borrowings from central bank. Uh, Pakistan has never borrowed heavily from the central bank, but the governments used to be criticized for, for resorting quite frequently to central bank borrowing. But I'm sure all of you must have noticed that in recent years, the government has followed a very strict discipline. It has paid a price for that also. The current uh, increase in uh, short-term interest rates is at least partly attributable to this constraint. Uh, but I believe that it is also a very positive sign that despite higher borrowing costs, the government continues to be committed uh, to, to meet its borrowing needs through, through the financial markets, the competitive markets, and not through central bank borrowings.
And finally, the important part of any borrowing strategy would be diversification. You should have diversified investor base, diversified instrument base. You should borrow in long-term, short-term, floating rate, fixed rate instruments. Uh, you should have Sharia compliant and conventional. So whatever is possible to meet all kinds of investor needs. I think that was pretty much it now. Coming to the current situation and whether I see any silver linings, I would like to tell you that, uh, as I just said, there are a few good things which are also happening, which give me a lot of confidence that after some pain and some difficult decisions, uh, Pakistan can hopefully uh, uh, change its direction, uh, the, the, the direction of its uh, fiscal policy, and, and, and hopefully over the next few years, the uh, debt figures would also, should also look much better. Uh, for instance, I would say that the crisis the one that we are currently facing, they put pressure on, on the governments to undertake long overdue reforms. I think tax reforms and higher tax collection have never been this high on the agenda. All of you must have noticed that taxation reform is high on the agenda of the federal government, not so much uh, on the provincial government's agendas, but the federal government is, is, has, has made a massive tax effort in, in recent years, uh, despite the COVID-induced uh, concerns regarding economic growth and everything. Uh, the government has shown commitment to undertake uh, tax reforms. Then there is a growing debate uh, regarding taxation of unproductive assets like land. I would say that this is also welcome development. And if we can develop a national consensus on that, I think that can also change our tax policy for the better, not just in terms of collecting more revenues, but also uh, changing the, 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 the direction and the incentives and, and, and the priorities. Uh, 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 for the investors in the economy. Uh, similarly, as I said, uh, uh, the government has followed a strict discipline in terms of not resorting to central bank borrowings. I think that's a very healthy sign. And if the government can st stick with this discipline and, and, and uh, uh, weather these difficult times, I think that would be a great achievement and that would send a very strong signal to the market. Uh, and, and finally, I, I would say pension reform was something that was unheard of until recent years, but now um, in this case, the provincial government seem more serious than the federal, uh, but we already see that there is a lot of conversation regarding pension reforms. And I think that's probably the single most important reform to restore the fiscal health and sustainability of this country. Uh, the government is, of KP has uh, given a pleasant surprise to the entire nation by, by taking the lead and, and by uh, amending their Civil Servants Act and, and making a public announcement of uh, switching from a defined benefit to a defined contribution pension scheme. I think that's a historical step that the government of KP has taken. Uh, and I'm quite positive that other provinces and the federal will follow suit over the next years. And that would be a very positive development as far as the financial future of this country is concerned. So with that, I would stop and hand over back to you, Mr. Saad. And I'm sure we have mostly equity market investors participating in today's session uh, and probably 
uh, uh, most of your questions would be targeted towards evaluating how the future is going to impact the equity markets. Uh, so over to you, Saad, and let's see if I'm able to answer the questions that our participants may have. So sure. I mean, um, as uh, now, if, if someone has a specific question, please uh, raise your hand and, and, and we'll allow uh, to ask this question directly. But otherwise, I actually had this particular question that, you know, of course, the last time you were, you know, handling this, uh, you know, maturity of the debt, uh, which we have uh, the seen, um, you know, did it, uh, you know, due part in terms of like reducing the overall cost. Otherwise, it could have been even higher. So, I mean, this uh, time, what do you think is the right solution? Is it like oh, we we definitely need more debt to, you know, to, to re, you know, having more debt is not an issue. As you just rightly pointed out, it's actually about the real GDP growth. So if you, uh, you know, increase your GDP in the future, of course, that debt sustainability is not going to be a major challenge. You know, you can, you can handle it. But does this also mean that we need to actually increase the savings rate with, for example, maybe the NSS, uh, you know, so we just have longer term debt for that. So we still work on the maturity of the debt or do you think there is some other solution? Yes, I think one reason that our domestic debt is mostly floating rate and relatively shorter term is that our financial markets are dominated by commercial banks whose liabilities are short term and floating rate. So they have a natural preference for these instruments. And the government, of course, cannot dictate the market. And the banks do invest in fixed rate long term instruments, but do that very opportunistically. So the mix of our financial markets needs to change. That's a structural reform that has not really happened over the last few decades, but let's hope that it will happen and the pension funds and the insurance companies who are the genuine long-term investors with a high preference for long-term fixed rate instruments will, will gain market share. I think uh, that would be, would set the stage for an even better profiling of, of the debt. But I would tell you that in my opinion, right now, our debt levels and our fiscal deficits are so high that I think that the debt strategy has very little flexibility. There are very few options that the debt managers have right now. I think um, right now, most of the contribution towards fiscal and debt sustainability needs to come from fiscal policy. The fiscal deficits have to decrease as, as a percentage of GDP and also considering the size of our domestic markets you know, they should be in line with the market's ability to lend. And of course, the government's fiscal deficit should not be so high that private sector is completely crowded out and the banks are and the other lenders are loaded with just government security. So right strategy rather than the debt strategy alone. So it, it has to be a combination. Fiscal deficits come down and hopefully the debt strategy is able to create more diversification. Uh, recently, uh, the sharp growth in Sharia compliant financial institutions assets has been a very welcome development. Uh, over the last two years, the federal government has to was able to raise huge amount of loans from Sharia compliant institutions at a very competitive rate. So this kind of you know diversification of investor base needs to continue. 
But right now, the constraints within which the debt office is operating, I think, are very daunting. And it's the fiscal policy that has to now uh, uh, improve um, drastically. The fiscal deficit has to come down big time. Uh, and we should be able to, uh, I'm hoping that uh, with IMF on board, uh, the government's commitment to to generate primary surpluses is will be will be stronger now. The governments have already shown some discipline in recent years. If you look at the primary surpluses, if COVID had not happened, we would be close to a primary balance. Uh, but after that, we did run on some primary deficit. But on the whole, as I said over the last few years, primary Deficits were not too high. So that is telling us that our debt levels are quite high already. Our cost of borrowing is rising and we need to generate primary surpluses. Now. So if there is one key takeaway from today's session, that should be that primary balance, balance is the key variable going forward. If we are able to generate primary balance over the next few years, I see that most of the things will fall in place, including the debt strategy, the cost of borrowing and all that. I think I took too much time answering your question. Maybe we can so, move on. Yeah, we, we have uh, then to ask a question. Please uh, kindly unmute yourself then, and then uh, Nihal Saab would be yes. asking questions as well, please. Uh, Sir Yusuf, uh, I have two questions. Uh, the first was that the how this debt challenge will be affecting the equity market as we we all are concerned with the equity market and i couldn't understand like what will be the key variables which will affect the equity market i think when you guys figure out the cost of equity and use it to run your valuation models Typically, risk-free rate is an important variable, and right now it's kind of very high, and I'm sure it must have shrunk the valuations in, in, in your financial model, so that should be your major concern. Yeah. My view is that the long-term bond is typically the one whose yield should be used as the risk-free rate, and those yields are always in the financial models. When I was an analyst, we used to keep them in the range of 11 to 12% for the 10-year PIB. So I think that has not changed much. Yeah, uh, Long-term yields are still close to that level. I think mostly it's a crisis of confidence. Uh, most of the people are looking towards the IMF program and they see it as a confirmation of the government's commitment to discipline itself. Uh, and if the IMF program is revived over the next few days, which I am quite optimistic it, it will be, I think that should be a positive trigger. Otherwise, the equity markets seem quite very undervalued. Uh, although I don't claim to be, be an, an, an expert on this subject. So the equity uh, market will be undervalued for the next five to six years. Till no, it is undervalued now. It is looking for positive triggers. I think it is looking for uh, a commitment from the government to change things and, and turn things in the right direction and revival of IMF program. Uh, will be like a confirmation of that commitment. And since the markets are forward looking, so I don't think that the markets do wait for the actual results. Once uh, the policy direction changes and the government's commitment is evident, I think the markets start responding sooner than later. Indeed, sir. Indeed. Uh, uh, answer. Yes, uh, sir, my second question was uh, related to your education. Uh, I'm an aspiring investor. I want to become an equity market investor, professional equity market investor. I wanted to ask that uh, 
एफ आर एम एंड सी एफ ए वुड दे एड इन सच अ प्रोविजन और नॉट वुड यू रिकमेंड Yes, yes. You should absorb, and you know, get every bit of knowledge you can acquire. CFA, FRM, maybe actuarial sciences, whatever you want. Another MBA, specialized master. So, you know, the thirst for knowledge should never end, and it will only help you improve your skills and okay. your. your understanding and your expertise so i think it's a never ending quest you should acquire more and more qualification now sir please uh, go ahead uh, you have a question please okay sir uh, so i recommend thank you for a very interesting uh, presentation uh mike i have two questions the first is relating to uh, nss and i and i fail to understand why the government still has this nss program you know it's become quite archaic um uh depositors and lenders can go to the the banks and with the current 50% tax the government gets some of the money back as well and it's not that the nss is a very efficient in many ways that right? being an investor in the nss i find that you know it gives me an opportunity to uh capitalize on the government's low response rate in 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 changing rates and and my second question is uh, you raised a very interesting point that ttk had changed from uh defined uh, benefit to defined contribution and, and uh, given our pension liabilities where do you value the, the numerical benefit if you know if we change to numeric uh, defined contribution as a country as a whole yeah the first one national savings i could not agree more with you i do agree that these are archaic and not market based and most of these schemes have free put options embedded into them uh and these are proving very costly for the government and for some reason the government has failed to reform them i think one major reason for that is that many of the decision makers who are supposed to make this decision themselves are invested in these schemes or their friends and relatives so they have a mindset uh, uh uh which is in favor of these schemes so i think that's an important reason it has become a part of our culture now uh uh, uh and many of the decision makers are actually conflicted they are invested in the, these schemes themselves uh or their 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 uh, professional communities which they are part of i think that is one stumbling block but i assure for a longer period you will see these schemes reformed <laughs> inshallah um the second one was regarding pensions yes uh the government's liability decreases immensely by switching from a defined benefit to defined contribution right now pakistan is running the most expensive db scheme in the world its implicit contribution rate is 65% so the government needs to contribute 65% of the pensionable pay every month implicitly to be able to pay the future pension liabilities so that's very exorbitantly high the international the average ranges between 15 to 25%. I think KP is going for a scheme where the contribution rate would be probably 20% or a little bit higher than that. So there's a huge cost saving and then there is very little risk also because the government makes the contribution up front and is not liable for any payments for whatsoever reason in future. so i think it's a huge reform probably the biggest fiscal reform in the history of the country if it takes hold and and other provinces and and the federal follow suit uh um dear sir you can unmute yourself and uh, ask a question assalam alaikum bhai sir uh, i just have a couple of question uh, my first question that the government has budgeted a sbp profit of 300 billion in the fiscal account 
Uh, now, given that we are expecting uh, anybody to interest rate in next year, and given the fact that SBB profit was 900 billion in FY20, so don't you think that the number is uh, quite low? I honestly do not claim that I fully understand why the budgeted amount is less, but I'll tell you my understanding. Uh, the current year's profit after the State Banks Act was amended in January, we are no longer, the, the, the ministry is no longer receiving the quarterly profits from, from State Bank. Now, the annual accounts of the State Bank are supposed to be audited first, and then any profit payments can be made. So the next year's allocation is the central bank profit that was supposed to be paid this year but what was not paid. So I think in the first two quarters, they did pay some, but in the third and fourth quarters, they have paid nothing. So I think this is the leftover, the expected figure that will now be received sometime in October next financial year. And the next year's SPP profits would be received in the year following that. So you understand the that the scheme has changed now. There, there is no quarterly payment and the annual accounts need to be finalized and audited before any profit can be paid. Okay. Raza, uh, you had another question. Also. Yes, uh, my second question is that uh, the government has budgeted debt servicing cost of uh, 3.9 trillion. Uh, now, given the fact that if the yield remained at elevated level that they are currently now, so don't you think that the uh, debt servicing can put, exceed this amount by a fair margin? Yes. Yes, I agree. This estimate has some highly optimistic assumptions embedded into it. And if things don't improve during the course of the next financial year, the interest expense can be higher. You're right. Thank you, Ash. Saad, I'm running out of time, maybe two, three minutes more, and then you have to let me go because I have to indeed, indeed, catch indeed. a meeting at five. Absolutely. And I think I, at the moment, I don't have any other question, but if someone wants to ask just last question, maybe we can. And otherwise, you know, your closing comments and we can wrap it up. I'm extremely grateful to all of you for making time for this. I don't have the words to thank you for listening uh, to, 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 to this uh, session. And uh, I hope that we'll have more more sessions in future, inshallah. Thank Many you, sir. Thanks, sir. Thank you. Many thanks, sir. Many thanks, sir. Many Thank thanks for you. The time. Much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.